Okay, so without further ado, I think I'm going to start by introducing my colleague, <laughs> um, soon to be Dr. Nompilo Chuma. And she's been working with educational technology since 2005. So she's a bit of a veteran and she's been uh, working with it in relation to student uh, and staff development since then. And she currently manages a range of EdTech resources um, that are both teaching and research related here at Rhodes University uh, in Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And her academic uh, staff development role involves supporting lecturers and as they integrate technology into teaching and learning through workshops, presentations, uh, she contributes as well in or in teaching on formal qualifications as well as providing individual uh, support. Uh, she's also an EdTech researcher uh, and academic staff developer who is passionate about challenging academics to be critically reflective about their use of educational technology, especially in light of calls for transformation in higher education in South Africa. And she's just completed, as I mentioned, her PhD in Information Systems at Rhodes University and will be graduating pretty soon. Um, so over to you, Nompilo. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me here today. And thank you to the IMAGE team for inviting me to run this session. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Could have just been me and the IMAGE team here today. So. I really appreciate you taking the time out from your busy schedules to discuss a topic that I am really passionate about. I'll try not to get too excited so that I can get through what I need to get through. And I think it's also a topic that is timely in our transforming and volatile African higher education context. Okay, uh, so I believe that the context has a greater impact on our use of educational technology than we give it credit for. Before we start interrogating our educational technology practices, however, I'd really like to know a little bit more about the kind of work that the people who are attending today do. Um, do you mind just saying, I could just assume that we all kind of support academics with educational technology, but I, I'm assuming that may not be true. And I'd just like to get a sense of the people who are here, the kind of work that you do in just a, a couple of words, in just a few words. Jerome is an academic and also supports academics, just like I do. Uh, Ingrid is teaching at a distance education institution and slowly moving online. I hope this session will um, help you in that direction. Uh, Gabrielle promotes the use of edtech and Tony is in professional development with technology, teaching with technology, both online and face-to-face. Sue, or Seox, uses technology for teaching. She's not a support person. <laughs> and she loves the edtech people who support her. Nice to know, Sue. <laughs> um, Frida is working on building edtech software with IT developers and engineers. That is very exciting, Frida. Um, I think you're the pe people that I need to be talking to. Anyway, you'll see from my presentation why I'm saying that. Uh, Noctula supports and participates as part of a professional learning community in distance education, uh, largely staff development for Shanali, professional learning oriented with technology integration as key. Uh, Olufemi, instructional technologist or lecturer, currently on sabbatical, lucky you, and Jakob, project management. Okay, so for most of us, we do support academics. Uh, but there are people working with other aspects and have an interest in educational technology. So I'd just like to welcome everyone. And as we're going through, just think about your particular context. Uh, and as you're thinking about your context, um, just apply the questions that we will be discussing throughout this session. 
Okay, so I've put up a, a question there, which was actually in the little abstract that I sent in. And I would like you to think about this question. I'm not going to ask you to type in an, a response at this time. Actually, I'm not going to ask you to type in a response at all, uh, because I'd like you to think differently or to challenge you to think differently about the answer or the response to this question. What impact does your use of educational technology have on your students and on your teaching? Does it really enable learning, which is, I'm sure, the purpose, the reason why you're using it? Or is it hindering learning? And I'd really like you to think really carefully about this question as we are going through uh, the slides, through this presentation. Um, the typical answers that I've got to this question when I have asked it to the academics in my institution include some of the following. Uh, I am just trying to catch up with my students who seem to spend most of their lives on their mobile devices. So I would think they appreciate that I've moved a step closer into their world. That's one of the answers I get to that question. And as you can see, it doesn't really talk about the impact on students, not really. It's a lecture just talking about trying to catch up with students. Another response I get to this question goes something like, I think the important question is what impact does it have on me? Because as an older academic, I have to conform to institutional requirements to use technology in my teaching and forsake my trusted chalkboard. So those are examples of some of the responses I've got. I don't know what kind of response you have in your mind, but I'd really like you to think really carefully about the impact it has on your students rather than on yourself. Because a lot of time, I think we, 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 we keep the focus so much to ourselves and forget about the students, the audience, the ones who should be learning from us. So the outline of my presentation today, um, first of all, uh, as I've said, the seminar focuses on interrogating our educational technology practices using critical reflection. To this end, we'll start off by discussing why we should be interrogating our practices, particularly in the context within which we work. Um, from the responses, I see that everyone who has connected to this session today is actually working in the African context somewhere in Africa, most of them in South Africa, but also from other parts of Africa as well. So for us, context is very, very important. So the why question, that's what we'll try to answer. Why should we be interrogating our practices? We will then move on to discussing the lenses we can use to examine our practices from different angles. So in other words, what is it that we should be interrogating? That will be the second part of the presentation. And finally, we will conclude with a toolbox of questions to help in the critical reflection process. So these questions are just uh, there to guide you. I'll talk about them when I get to them. You can expand on them, but they are there to help you to start thinking about how you can critically reflect using the different lenses that we'll discuss in the second stage. Why interrogate? So why should we bother about understanding the impact of our educational technology practices? I believe that technology has become so common and integrated in our lives that we've come to, point, to a point where we don't even notice it anymore. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, do you notice that you've switched on the light? Or do you notice when you, do you think about it when you switch on your stove or when you use your toaster or when you use your coffee maker or when you pick up your cell phone to check your messages? It's not something you even think about because it's become such a part of our lives. So technology has made our lives easier in many, many ways. And it has also had an impact on our culture in ways we never even thought possible. Particularly when you look at social media and mobile devices, these have had a particular impact on interpersonal relationships, not just um, between, uh, like, uh, not just personal relationships, but also the relationships we have with our students outside and outside and inside of the classroom. Because of its impact, we are at a point in time where technology is viewed as the answer to a number of challenges in African higher education. I mean, you find authors who talk about how technology can help, help us reach the marginalized students who haven't had access to technology. And yes, that is true to an extent that technology will help us grow student numbers without the need to grow our infrastructure. And considering 
the fact that most of our African governments are, yeah, are resource deficient. Sorry, I'm trying to find a better word, but they don't have the financial resources to actually expand the university and grow the capacity in order to cater for the age cohort, all the people who should be at university. Then this is actually a good thing, growing student numbers without the need to grow the infrastructure. Um, Technology could also help African universities take part in global research networks, which they wouldn't have otherwise been able to take care of, to take part in because of the cost of travel and all of that. And technology can also help us in African universities compete on a global higher education market through online learning. And there are many other reasons that have been given. And yet I would argue that we need to take a step back from the actual technology. There's, there's too much talk about the technology. And we need to look at the context within which it is integrated. To begin thinking about the context within which we work, please use not more than three words to describe your perception and experience of your institutional context. I'm really curious to see what people will write what things they will choose to focus on when they reflect on their institutional context. Waiting for the first one to appear, <laughs> the first response. Huge complex divided, wow. Federation, complex, unequal, diverse inequality, potential, collegial or exclusive, research intensive, academic, fragmented, overstretched, tentative, curious, rural, traditional, basic, performance driven, limited, value, focus, limited value focus, sorry. Wow. Do we see important things coming out of the responses that um, the participants that you have typed in so far? I don't know if we'll have any different responses from these. And I would have actually love to do a short survey to find out why people selected the words that they did use. Complex, dynamic, and resource constrained. Huge, stretched, limited resources. Okay, so the one thing that comes out for me, okay, there's passion, absorption, and resources. The one thing that is coming out strongly for me here is fragmentation and inequality. Um, I hope I'm, I'm picking out it out quite right. Um, and for almost everyone, there is uh, some negativity that we highlight. It's divided, it's unequal, inequality, it may have potential, but it's exclusive, uh, it's fragmented, tentative, um, and so on. So that points to... Um, a certain inequality, you can tell from these responses that we as academics or as academic de developers who are supporting academics in their, in their teaching and in their use of technology are actually not satisfied, we're not happy with the state of the university. You can tell from the responses that there are things that we are unsettled about, uh, a complexity and inequality that we wish was not there. Okay. Um, from the responses, we can see that each context is experienced differently. And I know there are people here who may be coming from the same university or from the same general area. I can think of two, Nicola and Sue. <laughs> um, but their perceptions and experiences are actually worlds apart. Do you realize that the way you perceive your context actually has an impact not only on your identity as a professional, 
we shall not go into today maybe another image seminar but also has an impact on your choices and on your practices with educational technology and you realize that this is true even for your students so the way that you view your context will actually have an impact on your technology practices your, your technology choices and the same goes for your students who will also experience that context in a very different way from the way that you experience it. So I've spoken a lot about the context and I'm going to explain here why context is actually important. All right. So as I've said, technology has become too obvious for us and we've come to take it for granted so much so that we forget that educational technology integration does not happen in a vacuum. It's something that happens within an already existing social context. I'll ask you another question now. Why did you start using the technology that you're using? For example, some may be using social media, um, some may be using mobile devices, whatever it is that you think is really innovative in your own context. Can you tell me why you started using that particular technology? Complexity may be a good thing. Thing, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, so to assist students from Penny uh, to be more accessible, uh, familiarity. Chris, I'm assuming you mean you were already familiar with that particular technology. To expand the possibilities of my learners, Jerome, your potential to reach more students, to enhance accessibility and inclusiveness because it opened new possibilities for learning and collaboration for educators, researchers and students. Affordable, innovative, look like fun and I like new things. <laughs> Potential for increased connection frees us students and me to do the important things. It was trending, Irene. <laughs> Okay, I was just waiting a few more seconds to see if there are any other responses coming through. Um, because the post office is the pits. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Ingrid. Okay, but anyway, what comes out for me from the responses that have been given here is that each of us has a certain attitude toward the technology. And usually the attitude is, um, is positive. Am I right? Okay. So whether we feel it's going to help us, uh, it is going to help our students to better access the resources that we have for them or engage students better or open new opportunities for our students. The point is that, <laughs> I don't want to be left behind. The point is that we do have a positive attitude towards technology, right? Yeah. So for, for those of us who, who actually use the technology, it's because we feel it will bring some kind of value to our lives, right? So this may have been proven or not, um, but somehow if we have come to use technology, then usually we already have a positive attitude about technology. Uh, which brings me to the point that I want to make um, in the first block here, which talks about attitudes towards technology. Uh, the fact that because technology has become so ubiquitous and we have it everywhere, we kind of assume that technology is going to do what it says it's going to do. And it doesn't always. Uh, from experience, we all know that technology in one way or the other, and I'm using it very generally, I'm talking about hardware, software, and a whole lot of other devices which can be classed as technology in 2019. We have all been let down at a very critical moment by technology. So it doesn't always do what we need it to do. We all have 
horror stories and mishaps. But somehow we always seem to forgive technology and go ahead <laughs> and still use it because we have experienced some positive um, results from using technology. Okay. And the, the other point I wanted to make around this was that it's interesting that if the government had to give a new directive to higher education institutions and say, okay, so we need you to start using this, or we need you to start using this template to develop your curriculum, or this assessment method has to be included in every single course or else we're going to take away your accreditation, for example. The dialogue and the debates that would go around the implementation of that before it can even be accepted by academics is huge, and I'm sure that applies to every institution. But when you're looking at technology, if we bring in something new, we don't interrogate it in the same way that we do everything else in higher education. And that is the problem, that is the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here. Um, and Tony says our positivity about technology should not blind us to the skepticism and negative assumptions of many colleagues in our institutions, exactly. right? And not just the negative assumptions, but also the wrong assumptions about technology. And we'll look at it a little bit, um, we'll discuss that a little bit in, in a few minutes. Okay. And then the other reason why context is really important is the legacy of colonialism in Africa. Most universities in Africa, and I'm, I'm talking here about the South African context, and I'm assuming it is probably similar in, in other um, African countries. Most of the universities that we have we, were built during the colonial era. So you can see it in the way the universities are resourced. So there are some universities that were built for particular racial and economic groups, and they are, even now those universities are better resourced. And this has an impact on the infrastructure that the universities have, the resourcing in those particular institutions, and particularly the provisioning of educational technology. Okay, so it, when, when I'm talking about the provision of educational technology, I mean the resources that you have available, what kind of internet access do you have, do you have a learning management system and uh, how widely is it used, what devices do you provide to your staff or to your students, and then also looking at what expertise is there in those universities, what institutional support does the university give for educational technology in terms of funding, in terms of policies, and what is the culture of the university in terms of educational technology use? I think all of those could actually be clamped under the legacy of colonialism because they've developed from a particular kind of university, which for, for those, for, for most of our countries, they're already independent. But at the turn of independence, when our African countries got independence, where were the universities in terms of resources and in terms of expertise and in terms of funding and in terms of the culture? Those will already be way ahead universities that were not built for uh, particular races. All right. And then Western developed technologies. Most of the technologies that we use were actually developed uh, in the northern part of our world. And if you go into the literature, you see that the, the context within which these technologies are developed are white male dominated environments. And their assumptions about teaching and learning are embedded in the, in the development of the technologies. Their assumptions about um, what, what is the best kind of learning, um, their assumptions that technology is neutral and will work in every context in the same way are all embedded in its development. So it's important when you're actually critically reflecting on your selection of a particular technology to, to think about all those things and to try and think back as you are using the technology, what kind of assumptions um, have the developers included in their development of this technology, number one, and number two, how can I mitigate them so that I can use it effectively in this context? Uh, if you think these Western developed technologies um, are developed by people who probably don't have an understanding of the social relations in the African context and how the learning relationship is negotiated, the power dynamics in the teacher-learner relationship in the African context. So they make their own assumptions and they include those assumptions 
about who has access to technology, what kind of devices will they be using in order to use this educational technology for teaching and learning. Um, so although all those are things that we need to think about. Um, the other point I wanted to make here was that the, the, the developers who actually develop these technologies kind of force us to align to a particular educational technology culture. And then we have the Moodle people, uh, like Rhodes and Stellenbosch, or we have the Sakai people, or we have the Blackboard people. And we've been forced into these silos um, when, when in effect we are actually, we actually should have our own technologies developed here. That's the ideal, we're not there yet. But when we are thinking about the technologies that we actually have, we need to think about, so what assumptions have they embedded here? And how can we overcome these assumptions so that we can use this technology effectively? The last one is that uh, the technologies that we use will often reproduce social inequalities. I won't talk a lot about this now, but I, I'm assuming you understand what I mean. Um, and I'll, I'll elaborate on it a, a little bit more later on. So this was just a brief outline of some of the reasons we should be interrogating our practices with educational technology and particularly why we need to look at the context, not just the technology itself, but the context. Can you, can you maybe share some others? I don't know if anyone has mentioned anything here. Unfortunately, I was focusing on the presentation and didn't focus on the comments. Is there anything interesting coming out of the comments before we move on? Yeah, there was one, a lot of uh, comments that were really fascinating. Um, sort of Tony also remarked that Western developed tech are often developed by people who don't have a deep understanding of the social relations um, or education. Um, probably he means in, in countries that are sort of in the global south. And then Shanali said, Wonders if we may be conflating geologies with race uh, and race with orientations to learning. Um, and so she's just seeking to sort of check her understanding. Um, and yeah, and then Frida also commented that assumptions in the North are very different from the African context. And she shares an example uh, about AR yesterday. Um, so augmented reality, I take it, you mean, Frida? She says that African students understand space in terms of security, access or resource and connections with our others. Uh, visiting students understood space from, uh, nor from the north, understood space as universe, stars, planetary alignments. Interesting example. Um, but I think let's go back to I think Shanali's comment. You can respond to that. Okay, um, just looking for the comment. Are you conflating geologies and race uh, with orientations to learning? Okay, so I'm not looking at orientations to learning at all. I'm just looking at in the African context, we have a certain way in which people relate to each other. I hope I'm, I'm responding to your question. Um, you'll find when you are in the African context, we have the word Ubuntu in almost every African language. It's, it's not Ubuntu, of course, not that particular word, but a word that means that, because that's the way we seek to relate to each other. So even in the teaching and learning relationship, there is that kind of respect which you don't find in other contexts, which you don't necessarily find in the Western context. People relate to each other differently and so on. And the problem is that, and I don't focus on it in this uh, particular presentation, but it's there in the paper um, on which this presentation is based, where I'm talking about the higher education context in Africa itself and why it's, it's problematic for Africa. The fact that we are teaching the Western curriculum and so on, that's fine. Um, but the biggest issue for me is that besides the curriculum, we have adopted their culture and their way of relating in the class. And you'll find it more pronounced in certain institutions than in others, which is why when our students come into university, they feel so alienated. Um, OK, 
okay, I'm, I'm digressing, but I hope I'm still <laughs> making the point that I want to make. So it's, it's not about orientations to learning, but it's about how if you are raised in Africa, you are raised in a certain way, you relate to people in a certain way, you relate to your elders in a certain way that's different if you were raised in another part of the world, for example. And if we have technologies that are developed outside of the African context, they don't take that relationship into consideration. It's not an assumption that they make about the teaching and learning relationship and the power dynamics in that relationship. Their power dynamics are very different from the power dynamics in our particular context. I hope I make sense. Okay, she's not convinced that we can separate social relations from relations to learning. Okay, uh, I'll leave it at that and move on, otherwise I will not finish. Okay, so what is it that we want to inter interrogate? This is the second part, I have one more part. These last two parts are very short, so don't worry about it. I should be done in a few minutes, then we can have more time for discussion. Okay, so in this section, uh, we'll briefly look at the different lenses that you will use to interrogate your educational technology practices. Uh, but before we do, I would like to ask, from what we have discussed so far, what aspects do you think are important for you to consider when interrogating your educational technology practices? I'm going to elaborate on them just now, but from what we have discussed thus far and from the comments that have been made such a rich, um, yeah, very rich comments here. Yeah, I'll go through them all later on. Um, what things do you think we should be considering when we are interrogating our educational technology practices? What should we be looking at? Relevance, um, what is the target, the knowledge of practices we want, and does the technology facilitate this? Pedagogies for a digital age, okay, the words are moving up really fast. <laughs> uh, resource issues, for example, bandwidth and expensive cell tech for Wi-Fi, just as one aspect. Who is assumed to be benefiting, is it for the students really, or to make life easier for the lecturer? Uh, relationship is different as the context. Um, thank you for, for elaborating on relationships or, or the family in terms of respect as we have it in most of our African cultures. Um, what kind of humans we are trying to contribute to making skills level? Does the technology allow, so when you say skills level, Chris, I'm assuming you're talking about digital skills here, probably both for students and for uh, academic staff as well. Does the technology allow engagements, ownership and critique that other pedagogical approaches don't allow as well? What kinds of learning interactions we believe are valuable? Yes, digital skills, okay. So I'll just move on. Um, so, for, you are all right, um, based on what we have discussed so far, all of these are really important. And I was just trying to find a way of, um, of grouping them. Um, yeah, and, and you will see how I have done it in the next slide. So, your institutional or departmental context, you have to critically reflect on that. And maybe what I should have actually done earlier on was, to mention what I mean by critical reflection. I've been saying critical reflection, critical reflection, but I didn't really explain what that is, and people understand it in very different ways. Um, so when I'm talking about critical reflection, I'm talking about thinking about your own practice and looking at how in your practice as an academic, as a lecturer, you may have some 
masked or um, you may have some masked or hegemonic assumptions that you have, um, which may not necessarily be true. So when you're critically reflecting, it's actually an uncomfortable process because you're trying to put yourself in a position of, okay, so what assumptions do I have? Are these the right assumptions that I should have in this context, or should I change them in order to enhance the teaching and learning, and particularly the students' learning? And if you're going to bring technology into the mix, then you also include technology in your reflections, and we'll see just now how to do that. Okay, so you have to uh, interrogate your institutional context, your teaching practices outside of educational technology before you even bring in educational technology. And then for each technology that you bring in, you also have to, um, yeah, we've spoken about the different aspects that you have to look at in the particular technologies, particularly where they were developed and the assumptions that were made in their development. Uh, students' experiences, you have to look at that. Uh, feedback from your peers and also the literature. So from what I have here, these are things that I've actually um, um, taken from Stephen Brookfield. He's a, a professor in adult education somewhere in the United States. And he has written a book about being a critically reflective teacher. It's a powerful book that I think every academic should read. And in that book, he speaks about four lenses that you can use to critically reflect about your teaching. He talks about autobiographies, our autobiographies as learners and teachers, uh, drawing from peer feedback, drawing from student experiences, and building on theoretical literature. So for our autobiographies as learners and teachers, I sit as an academic, and I'm going to interrogate my assumptions and my beliefs about educational technology. And I've got, in the next couple of slides, questions to kind of guide you um, when you're doing this interrogation. That is the toolbox that I was talking about. Uh, drawing from peer feedback. Here you are going to appear in your department or in your discipline, someone who understands what teaching and learning means in your department, the kind of knowledge that you're trying to get your students to understand and to create. You get that person and have them have critical conversations with them about your teaching, but also have them observe your teaching and see how you're doing in that teaching. Uh, and then drawing from student experiences, I don't think there's anything as powerful as student feedback in actually understanding the impact of your teaching. Of course, you always have to take student feedback with a grain of salt sometimes, uh, because students don't always like being uncomfortable, and they may give you ne negative feedback. But it's important to get um, uh, feedback from students about their experiences and, and particularly about the power dynamics that happen in the classroom. And then building on theoretical literature. This is where you know you're not the first person to use a particular teaching method or a particular learning technology. Go and find out how others have used it and how they've experienced it. And also what has become important for me in the last few years is theory. And the way that theory helps you to have a lens to explain what it is that you are doing, that's also an important, important part around the theoretical literature. So how do we then go about interrogating our practices? Okay, so as I said, I'm going to be using um, the four lenses from Brookfield. And I asked Jakob to upload a document for me, and I'll share the link to it now. That is the link, and if you go to that document, it's got the full list of questions. We don't have time to go through each and every one of those questions, um, but if you click on that link, you should be able to access the document. Let me just click on it as well, just to make sure. Yes, I am able to access it, so you should be able to access it as well. All right. So when you are interrogating your educational technology practices, when you're looking at your autobiographies, this is the first lens. As learners and teachers, I've just selected one question from there, uh, from the list of questions that I came up with. 
And that question is, considering the culture of the university and the culture and engagement I seek to maintain in my classroom, what aspects of using educational technology, of using this educational technology, will support or hinder this culture? And how can I mitigate the constraining effects of the educational technology on this classroom culture? So this particular question is asking you to look at specifically your classroom culture. Um, and obviously the classroom culture will be embedded in some way in the institutional culture. Um, and then you look at how bringing in educational technology changes that culture, changes the way students relate to each other, how they relate to you, and so on. Um, and what implica or sorry, how you can mitigate any constraining effects uh, if it changes the culture in a negative way from what you may have expected. Okay, uh, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this particular question. There are many others there, um, you can quickly browse them. The first one looks at my own positive and negative experiences of learning when I, as a teacher or when I was a student using educational technology and what implications those have um, for my use of educational technology now. And then the second question asks why I selected this particular technology, uh, what guided that choice? Uh, and then the third one asks my assumptions about the kind of learning this particular technology supports and the source of those assumptions. And then the, the, the next one is the one that's listed on the slide. And the next one looks at power dynamics that already exist in the class and how I think the technology will perpetuate these. Um, and then from what I know about my students, who is going to be advantaged? Who is going to be disadvantaged by this technology? Okay, so is it going to enable learning for some and hinder learning for others? And then is there any way that this technology could be considered a barrier to learning by some students? Okay, in terms of technology access, digital abilities, and so on. So any comments on any of these questions in this first toolbox? Uh, that's very true, Chris. We do tend to, um, when you're looking at theoretical literature, we do tend to apply technology in isolation of any kind of literature or any kind of theory. If I decide to use Facebook in my class, um, I need to take the time out to go and see, okay, there is a whole set of literature on Facebook for teaching. I need to go and understand what they're saying, what challenges they've experienced, and so on. That's a very important point. Okay, um, how am I using the word culture in this particular instance? Um, I'm looking at the accepted way of being in the classroom, how the teacher relates to the students and the student relates to the teacher, how they communicate. Um, yeah, you'll find in, in some classrooms, the lecturer is very strict about, you need to call me professor so-and-so. And that's kind of the culture that that uh, academic has, has developed in the classroom. And others will want to be called by their first name. And the way students can interject during the lesson or not, depending on who the lady. So kind of the social relation and the accepted way of being and of communicating in the class. That's what I'm referring to when I'm talking about culture. Tula likes the word maintain. OK. All right, so I will just go on to the next slide. All right, so on the next slide it says, has the use of this technology had any impact on how you view yourself? So this, these are questions you'd give to students, of course, on how you view yourself as a learner and, your, and on your development in this course, in what ways? Um, so I found that uh, quite a few academics, a great percentage of the academics in my institution 
get feedback from students on their teaching, right? And on the course development and the curriculum and so on. But in very few of those instances, do they actually include questions around the integration of technology in that course? Um, I know that technology shouldn't be viewed as separate, yes, but when we consider the context within which we work and the constraints that some students experience in terms of technology, I think it's actually important to ask specific questions around the use of technology. Um, so in the second part, um, any comments or any questions? One of the other questions which I, I quite like is in what ways did the teacher or fellow students aggravate or minimize um, their feelings of being disempowered or marginalized in the class through educational technology? And I think those are important questions to ask um, the students. Um, okay, I'm moving on. We're almost out of time. Okay. What ground rules will support open and respectful critical conversations between us? So here you are seeking for feedback from your peers about your use of educational technology. And in this instance, it's good to find a peer who is already interested or using educational technology, but also someone who really understands disciplinary knowledge and teaching and learning practices in your discipline, because different disciplines will do it differently depending on the knowledge structures and so on. Uh, but before you can actually engage in that peer feedback relationship, there has to be a relationship of trust between you and the peer, so that they can be free to tell you if there are any issues that uh, they observe. Uh, so it's good to set those ground rules and know that the conversations are always going to be respectful even though they may be critical, and even though they may be hurtful, but they'll always be respectful. And there are other questions that I have in that section as well, but I'll move on because we are just about out of time. Uh, Frida, you mentioned the issue of culture from the learner's perspective. As I said, these are just questions to get you started and to get you thinking about some of the important issues. So you'll notice that in the first one, autobiographies, I included quite a lot because it's easier for you to think through the different things. Uh, but with student experiences, you can formulate questions around culture. Uh, I think it is important to understand their perspective of the culture of the classroom and maybe even the cultures that they come in with into the classroom and their expectations of, of um, the technology and the classroom dynamics and so on. Um, thank you, Jerome. All right, so the next, uh, okay, that was peer feedback. The last one looks at literature and theory and I've included two questions here on the slide, although they are more um, in, the, in the handout that was uh, sent through. How has this technology been used in the past and how have issues of power and culture been addressed? So it's not just about, so this is Facebook, yes, um, and this is how it has been used. There are really important issues that we need to consider. And I'll keep going back to the African culture, the African culture, because I think that is really important. And there are questions that, if we can find literature, literature that speaks to these issues, so you're looking at a particular technology, but it should also speak to issues of power, power dynamics in the class, and issues of culture, for it to really be applicable and really help you move your educational technology use forward. And then what theories have been effective in illuminating social issues in the use of this and alternative technologies? And what assumptions do these theories make about issues of power and culture in teaching and learning contexts? Okay, so I included two questions there because the first one looks at literature specifically. Uh, so any published work and the second one looks at theory. And I think as educational technologists and people working with technology, we really, really need to move beyond just learning theories um, or just theories around technology, the technology acceptance model and all of that. 
and really think about social theories. And the reason why I, I'm stressing social theories, I'll go back to the point I made at the beginning. Technology integration does not happen in a vacuum. It happens in an already social existing in an already existing social context. There are already power dynamics there. There is already a contested space, as a lot of you uh, already highlighted in your own context. So if we use social theories to understand our integration of educational technology, it will actually give us a better picture of the impact that it has. Uh, and then finally, um, this is just the conclusion. Reflecting on your context, why would you consider interrogating educational technology practices? So this is just to take you back to what we have discussed and reflecting on which aspects of your practice have been ignored and could benefit, sorry, reflect on which aspects of your practice have been ignored and could benefit from critical reflection. And finally, why is it important to triangulate the data from the four lenses? Okay, so I will end it here. Uh, maybe I can just make a final comment on the last one and say, uh, for me, it's really important to bring in data from different lenses, rather than just reflecting and reflecting on, on what you are doing. Uh, there are things that you are going to miss. But when you have students coming in and telling you, um, this is actually not working, or this is working really well, or you have a peer looking at you and giving feedback, or you have uh, literature telling you what has worked and what hasn't, and different social theories, I think that gives you a richer set of data which will actually help you to critically reflect on your educational technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nompilo. It was really deep and fascinating. Um, and I hope folks can find that, uh, find that resource uh, useful. I think I'll share the link again so that you can um, download it. And Jakob, I'm sure you can add it to the uh, Emerge site or something as well. Um, so folks can always go back. And yeah, we've four minutes to two o'clock. I want to say any further questions there have been yeah all comments there have been a lot of fascinating sort of debates happening in the text chat and um people sharing things that they've found oh shanai says there was mention of a paper do we have details for that okay so nampilo is going to share the link now and she's just got to find it. All right, so uh, perhaps share it in the Facebook event page. Would that be fine? Okay, cool. So she's just, she's just going to look for it and she'll share it on the Facebook event page. Um, so Jerome has uh, has a question. Yeah, he says regarding students' experiences. Um, my previous experience, also based on our cultural perspective, has shown that students would be hesitant to respond to questions in a way that they feel might um, be face-threatening to their instructor. Um, what do you say? That is actually a very true assertion. Uh, thanks, Jerome, for bringing it up. Uh, I have also seen it in my own experience here in our university where you'll find certain students will be happy to say what they want to say to the lecturer's face, but others find it really difficult. Um, in my department, to try and counter that, um, we have focus group interviews with the students, where someone who is not in the department, the students don't know that person, comes in and speaks to small groups of the students and asks them questions around the use of technology or whatever other feedback that the teacher requires. And then you find in that space, because they're sitting in a circle, if one of them has the courage to start speaking out, then the others are able to contribute as well. Um, so taking the teacher out of the picture and bringing someone, we use our department, which is the academic development, will go in and sit with the students in very small groups, maybe groups of 10 or even groups of five, and then discuss with the students particular questions. 
and then in, in that instance, I've found students do tend to open up most of the time. So thank you, Nompila. Um, yeah, and Jerome says that's great. Um, yeah, so I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us. Please feel free to continue the discussion on the Facebook event page, um, where we'll, as I mentioned, Nompila will be sharing a link to the article she mentioned, and we'll also share the link to this um, list of questions. It is openly licensed, <laughs> so you can use it. I mean, there's so many of you who have said that you're doing academic development work. We encourage you to make use of um, this, uh, these questions with your uh, colleagues, some of the lecturers that you're working with, and encourage them to interrogate and reflect on their educational technology practices as well. Um, wishing everyone a wonderful day further. And thanks, a big thanks again to Nompilo um, and to everyone for your deep and engaged participation. And thanks everyone for coming. As I said, it could have just been me and the image team. So <laughs> yeah, it's really been an awesome time. Thank you all. Bye.